Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, welcome to the monthly webinar. Uh, we're just waiting for everyone to log in. Um, I need to get the presentation up and running. Um, yeah, this is our regular managed portfolio kind of monthly webinar. We're going to chat about what's going on in the markets um, yeah, and have a, a quick look at performance. Uh, and I've got yeah, the, the one interesting uh, stock pick I for you today as well. Um, just to get the presentation open and share my screen with you. Uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions all the way through. You guys can hit me in the, the chat. Uh, the chat uh, window is probably easiest. You can also use the Q&A function. Uh, we all should be quite used to Zoom by now, um, given the pandemic and how it's forced us all to work from home and to uh, become more digitally savvy. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, like I said, like just ask them uh, all the way through the presentation. I really don't mind stopping and, uh, and kind of trying to answer as, as we go along. Um, the whole idea of this is not to be a pre-recorded show or, you know, something that we've, uh, it's, it's meant to be a little bit more informal so that you can ask questions and uh, you can uh, interact. That's the whole idea of Zoom um, is to replace that kind of uh, interaction where we used to do it in our, in our offices. Uh, you might hear a little bit of banging in the background as well. Um, we're sitting in the JSC at the moment. They're busy using the pandemic to renovate their buildings. So the whole place is just dust and, and people tearing things apart. Uh, but uh, hopefully it's not too bad in the background. Um, okay, I just want to check if everyone's on. If there's any issues with audio or there's any issues with the uh, you know, video or anything like that, please let me know. Um, but yeah, I think everything looks good. So I'm going to get started. Um, yeah, it's been a little bit of a, a different uh, a different time uh, over the last month. Uh, we've had uh, very, very strong markets. Uh, okay, so let's have a look at what's actually happened. Uh, but before we get started, uh, let's see. This is not it. There we go. Uh, if you, this is your first presentation that you're joining, I'm just going to take you through a little bit of who we are and what, why we do this for you. Um, yeah, so we were ranked uh, the number one stockbroker in South Africa in 2019. Uh, this, you know, this is kind of this is a, a, a survey run by Intellidex. It's quite a robust, uh, a robust analytic uh, process. Uh, they send uh, mystery shoppers to see how our services with clients. And we have to fill in a very comprehensive questionnaire around our, our uh, risk, uh, uh, the risk. Uh, how can I say it? Our, our uh, product risk uh, spectrum and, and all the, the different uh, routes that we use to marketing so that they can evaluate how safe uh, trading with us is. Um, at the same time, they also, as I said, survey our client base uh, and that gives them, uh, you know, they, they take all the feedback from the client to see, see how they are experienced in this, the service of the company. Um, it's kind of the, the, the premier awards in South Africa. So, you know, we, we kind of just actually topped our standard bank I think the third place was Absa. So you're talking about massive institutions that compete in this, uh, which I think lends to a lot of credibility. Uh, we were also ranked the top advice broker in 2019, and we won the People's Choice Award. So our client base was very happy with us. Hopefully, we can keep them happy again. We actually still back to second place in 2020. We won Best Online Broker and Best Tax-Free Savings Account. So that kind of almost rounds out all the awards over two years. Um, but uh, but really, I mean, 2021 is what we're really aiming for, um, and one of the reasons that we do these presentations is trying to keep it, keep in touch with the client base. Uh, you know, obviously, it has been a lot more difficult with the pandemic, but just to give you guys uh, access to information, the ability to ask questions. Um, and to try and uh, deliver as much value as possible. We're always open to suggestions. So if you would like to uh, make suggestions, just uh, send an email to info at ransource.com. Uh, by, by all means, hit me in the chat as well. Um, the idea is to try and make these uh, presentations as useful to you guys as possible. Um, and hopefully you will then uh, be satisfied as a client and vote for us in the upcoming awards. Um, if you don't know what our products and services are and what we do, as I said, our, our real core business is stockbroking. So we do online trading, uh, which is, is one division, which is uh, very much a self-directed product. Uh, we give you the systems. It's what we run the best online broker for. We give you the systems and tools to manage uh, money yourselves. Uh, we do these kind of presentations as well to try and, you know, just inform you as to what's going on. Obviously, we want you to be profitable, but if you're pushing the button and doing everything yourself, we have very little control over your actions. So uh, we want to try and make you as profitable as possible. It's one of the reasons that we do this. 
And um, we have private broking as well. That's for our slightly bigger clients. Uh, we normally start private broking. Okay, uh, online trading accounts start with a minimum of 5,000 Rand. Uh, private broking starts with, at a minimum of 5 million Rand. So very, very different uh, minimum starting balances. But then obviously what you get is you get a personal broker uh, that's going to work with you on your portfolio. They're going to source research. They're going to kind of monitor things. You still make the decisions, but they, they assist you with that. Managed portfolios, this moves into the discretionary space where you know, we do it under personal share portfolios, but we essentially manage money for you. So we have one really one managed portfolio that, that we're going to chat a little bit about today. That is uh, our global equity portfolio, 100% equity. It's uh, just about at its five year track record at the moment. It's outperformed the market five, uh, four years out of the last five. Uh, last four years out of four, it has outperformed uh, its benchmark, which is the NCI world. Um, and I'm particularly excited about what's happening in the managed portfolio space over the next couple of months. We're launching two new uh, managed uh, portfolio baskets, one focusing on Europe, one focusing on the UK. Um, and we're going to kind of do a little bit of a splash IPO style uh, launch of them uh, where clients will be able to buy in uh, at a discount on, on opening as well. So that's kind of managed portfolios. Viv Governor takes care of our structured products, which are medium risk products. Uh, they generally have capital protection in them. Um, you know, you link to an index, you have 20% capital protection, and then you take participate in upside. They're generally credit products. We've just um, concluded one with uh, Citibank uh, out of Luxembourg. Uh, we designed the uh, product for ourselves. Designing a product, so, you know, you, you need slight, you know, for, for, for bespoke clients, it's, it's a little bit more pricey. You need about $250,000, but then we really can build something directly for you. Every now and again, we launch them, which are general products, which you can enter for about 100,000 rand. So much, much cheaper if you're uh, doing it as a bulk product, but we've got some very nice bespoke stuff that we do for clients. Uh, obviously, offshore transfers is a sub, uh, kind of a subsidiary business. We, because we work so much internationally, um, the ability to move money backwards and forth, uh, backwards and forwards across border at very, very low cost is important to us. Um, it, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of developed as a, a standalone business, but we, we've kind of been ranked by a lot of different uh, independent uh, blogs and websites and you know, uh, investigative uh, journalists uh, as the lowest cost provider in South Africa. And uh, for us, it really is a subsidiary business to try and uh, just assist our clients overseas. The more volume we get through it, the better the rates we can give our clients, which is really the philosophy behind the business. Uh, and then we've got kind of a formative wealth management, which is run by Yaku, a certified financial planner. Um, he can kind of help you with a more holistic view. And then, of course, our tax free savings accounts, which are, um, yeah, award winning. It's, uh, you know, we basically give them to our clients for free as long as they have a second product. Um, we believe, obviously, in the, in the stockbroking model. So we kind of end up uh, managing it via ETFs, um, which is quite interesting. So Diana Faree is the guy to talk to about that. That's really who we are and what we do. Um, so let's go get on. So what are we doing here? We're talking about the April monthly review. So we're just going into May. We're going to talk about a couple of things that happened last month. Basically, the state of the, the global economy, where we're at, how we are thinking about markets at the moment, um, and basically trying to having a little bit of a look at the, the, the top-down uh, side of the, the analysis. Where what, what are the pressures that are that are uh, coming to bear in stock markets uh, and, and financial markets. How are they playing out and how should we be positioned? So that's really what we're going to cover. I'm going to do my global market overview. We're going to look at the commodities and currency markets as well. And then we're going to chat a little bit about uh, the managed portfolio. So start with the uh, global market overview. Um, interestingly, uh, and I try to work out what was going on here, but it, and we, we're going to have a look at the, the French index, but uh, France is way out front this month. So you know, we, we have the US uh, best performing uh, best performing market. Now, all of this is done in US dollar terms. So the, the comparison that you're seeing here with France, again, the francophone country is kind of doing a, a little bit better if you want to call Canada francophone. But um, now France and Canada both up very, very strongly. Um, you know, UK also performing better. So we're seeing kind of the European markets coming a little bit more to the fore. Uh, the US uh, still up. It was the best performing market last month. And the US has generally been the better performing market over a long period of time, over 20 years. Um, you know, South Africa coming off a little bit, so we're down uh, about 1.2% in dollar terms, so we have had our currency strengthening up a little bit, uh, but overall our market has slipped back, and I'm going to show you why that is as well. Um, China again under pressure, so we've had a lot of pressure on Chinese markets recently. So, you know, the last couple of weeks have been a little bit disruptive. Uh, we've got into kind of like the, the Labor Day holidays. Uh, and um, this, this kind of goes up until today. So I'll these statistics this morning. So it does include the first week of May as well. 
Um, but China, you know, very, very, very interesting. I mean, that market's been in an incredible amount of pressure, and a lot of it, I think, has to do just with concerns around what, what the what the the Chinese authorities are going to do in terms of regulation. So some of their big tech companies have been under a lot of pressure recently, and that's kind of taken the shine off, off, off some of the indices. I think there's also just concerns around kind of the rising tensions that we're seeing between the U.S. and China. Uh, we're also seeing that kind of playing out in Australia as well. There was, uh, you know, a huge spat between whether China was going to accept uh, Australian iron ore. Um, obviously, there's been kind of cyber attacks by China against Australia as well. It's been all sorts of uh, global commentary around uh, uh, human rights abuses in China as well. So China kind of, you know, while it has been such an engine of growth over the last, uh, say, 20 years and such a huge commodity guzzling country, which has really helped to lift us. It was also one of the countries uh, going through the pandemic that actually managed to st still have uh, positive economic growth in GDP terms, one of the very few. Um, its markets are not doing particularly well. Now, part of the reason that their markets are, are you know, kind of sometimes divorced from the underlying economics is that their markets are very retail driven. What do I mean by that? A retail-driven market means that it's private clients that are, are, are essentially buying and selling that market. It's not large institutions. Now, uh, typically, the, the way you would think of that is private clients are more susceptible to sentiment-driven uh, uh, sentiment trade. They, they have less, uh, they, you know, almost you want to call them weaker hands if you want to do it that way. Whereas institutions have very uh, established frameworks so when it comes to investing. They have an analyst that covers the company. The analyst puts out a recommendation. Uh, their, their portfolio managers or, or their fund managers can only invest based on specific research once the fundamentals will change. They don't pick up the noise and the price as much. They only take much bigger positions in companies. With China, is many, many small traders all um, kind of almost herding together uh, and creating the price movement. So you get much more from the volatility in China. You also get uh, a lot less price discovery in China as well. So, uh, you know, there's all, all sorts of... Um, I suppose, concerns around the actual uh, figures that Chinese companies put out. So generally that creates volatility because there's this kind of, um, uh, I suppose, detection risk, if you want to put it that way, that potentially they, they could be producing numbers that are not valid. Um, and that also creates concerns. It's one of the reasons that the Chinese market trades at a much lower PE than, uh, than a market like the, the New York, uh, like the New York markets, for example. Um, it really is that risk premium that's sitting inside China. And we've seen China now under pressure. Um, at some point, though, with the kind of move that we've seen into, into emerging markets in South Africa, has definitely been a beneficiary of that. Um, with a move into emerging markets, you would expect a, a country like China to be doing maybe a little bit better. We're seeing it picking up more in, in kind of the, the India, Brazil, um, uh, Russia, uh, Turkey, Russia. These markets doing a little bit better than China overall. Um, and that, for me, maybe presents an opportunity. Now, there are real concerns around China. We, we spoke about it in our investment committee meeting yesterday, about the long-term prospects of China from a demographic point of view. Uh, remember, China had that uh, one, uh, one, one is best, or at least one child policy for a long time. And that's created a very strange demographic skew in China. <coughs> Now, what that's, going to, uh, what that's going to create is an aging population. And looking out, say, 15 to 20 years in China, you're almost looking at China becoming, uh, you know, an aging population like Japan, where they're not going to have workers coming into China to replace the, 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 older, the older people. <clears throat> that could create an enormous strain on the economy as well. Now, this is not something that markets are probably suddenly waking up to. Oh, well, wait a minute, there's going to be a demographic problem. This is probably not why China's down for this month. But it is something to consider when investing in China. Now, what is the best way to invest in China? It's very, very difficult. So we've looked at building Asian portfolios. One of the reasons we're launching a UK and a European portfolio is because we like the regulatory environments there. China a lot more difficult to invest in. And if you are going to try and look to capture either broad Asia or Asia Pacific <coughs> exposure, it's usually better to do it through an ETF. Um, if you're interested in that, Christo uh, Cross on our desk has got uh, an interesting idea about kind of building a managed ETF portfolio. Um, we've been chatting about that. It hasn't been launched with clients yet, but it's basically you're going to drop Singapore out of the mix, which is a very uh, financially driven uh, uh, market, uh, and kind of just just harness uh, Taiwan and um, you know, Vietnam, Philippines, that kind of those kind of economies with a little bit of Australian exposure. But it's going to be Pan Pacific, um, but that's another way of doing it. If you do want direct China exposure, you can check out an ETF called FXI. 
Um, FXI, it's, it's just a large cap Chinese ETF. You're going to have volatility in that product, but it could be a nice diversifier. And you know, with the, the kind of retail nature of China, you know, it does come off. And as I said, it's been coming off uh, pretty pretty steeply the last couple of months. Um, you often get that kind of elastic move back up as people get optimistic about emerging markets. So there could be an opportunity to, to buy China, but there's certainly risks uh, associated with it. France and Canada, what's going on in Europe? Um, so I've had a look, okay, so before, before I look at the underlying indices, I'm just going to take it out to give you a bit more perspective because obviously this is just a one-month view, so that's uh, giving you a one-month view of the, the markets. Longer term, South Africa still on top. I got all sorts of flack for not being, being too biased, putting South Africa on top. There's a lot of hatred around South Africa doing well. People say, oh, it's just a strong land that's doing this. This is in constant currency. This is in dollars. So this, this, this chart is showing that over the last year, South Africa is the best performing market out of the, the selected markets here. Um, by, by a significant margin, France was, was kind of uh, trailing a little bit. Uh, but obviously, with the strong month France has had now, we've seen France catch up as well. Um, the U.S. was on top of, you know, probably two, three months ago. They did come out of the coronavirus very, very quickly. Um, they didn't kind of uh, get hammered quite as hard because obviously those big tech companies didn't fall with the idea that they were going to be in work, uh, work from home mode. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, but US is mid table at the moment. As I said, China having a, a bad couple of months now, and that helping over one year to, to, to have them coming up, uh, you, you know, bottom uh, at this stage. Uh, why is South Africa doing so well? Uh, so well? Uh, it's also got to do with commodity prices. The commodity price boom has really lifted some of our bigger uh, portfolio, at least our bigger index positions, uh, things like uh, Anglo-American Platinum, and that's helped to boost uh, boost the overall index. Um, there is a little bit more going on inside the index, which we're going to look at in a second. Um, so before we get to France and South Africa, let's just have a quick look at the heat map of uh, what's going on in, uh, in the, the US. This is an S&P 500 heat map. Um, and you can see it's kind of been a mixed month. Last month, it was super, super positive. Everything was green. And when I said green, it was the big, the big FANG stocks were green. So we had the likes of Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, all up uh, significantly. Uh, it's still a very green picture. We've had a very strong month uh, overseas, um, or at least in the S&P 500. But it's come more from kind of the, 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 the smaller uh, stocks within the index. Uh, industrial is doing very, very well. And this is really what we're looking to add to the portfolio at the moment. We've, we're looking at Danaher uh, at the moment. We've looked at Danaher for a long time. It's a medical technology company. Uh, we haven't decided to pull the trigger just yet. Um, but yeah, industrial is doing well. We're still seeing a little bit of a tailwind in energy. As you know, we've kind of downweighted our energy after going heavily into energy in, in November, uh, buying both Slumberger and um, and Ex uh, ExxonMobil, uh, we have that downweighted. So we, we've removed them from the portfolio. While they are up this month, they, they're kind of still at, around the levels that we exited. It's not to say that uh, you know the oil and gas stocks are not going to, to push uh, uh, you know, hard still. Uh, oil prices could still go a, a lot higher, and in which case uh, you, know, you will see these oil and gas companies doing very well and recovering. Uh, but for us, just the idea of kind of the, the dirty energy, we're looking for energy exposure in more, uh, more renewable space. The problem, of course, is that if you look at solar and uh, ways of accessing it, it's just incredibly expensive. There's a lot of hype built into those companies. And when you actually dig into them, uh, there's a lot of garbage underneath there. And uh, there's guys that are you know, delivering a couple of solar panels and they're sitting on, on sort of uh, 500 times earnings. Uh, it's not something that we put in a portfolio. So we are looking for something a little bit more established. Um, the, the hunt continues. And we, we're hoping to, to pick probably uh, either an energy utility company that... Um, uh, that is, is looking at uh, harnessing wind and, and solar and renewable sources, or we're going to look at something like Total, which is a, a you know a traditional oil and gas player that is quickly adapting to the you know the the, the newer um, more carbon neutral environment. So that's where we we're looking at it. Oil and gas, we are we, we haven't yet deployed into that sector. But uh, yeah, it did pretty well last week. Uh, financial services is still doing very, very well. Now, the reason financial services is doing well, there's real inflation fears, which we're going to talk about in a bit as well. With higher inflation expectations, that kind of, it changes the way that, uh, that uh, portfolio allocations work, especially with big institutions. It, it makes value stocks more, uh, more, how can I say, more attractive than growth stocks. Um, and because of that, uh, we are seeing kind of a, a little bit of a rotation back into value as these inflation expectations start to pick up. And we've seen that specifically in the financial services and the banking sector. 
but overall a little bit mixed on, on the uh, on, on the big technology companies. Obviously, we've got semiconductors under a huge amount of pressure at the moment. Why are semiconductors under pressure? You say there's a global chip shortage. Surely they should be doing fantastically well. Um, the problem is there's demand. They just can't meet that. Uh, that uh, they can't. They, the supply doesn't meet the demand at the moment. People are starting to get concerned that they're going to drop. Uh, they're going to drop revenue basically because they can't meet the demand that they uh, that they're seeing. Uh, it's a great problem to have, I suppose, but not a great problem if you require those chips. So we see the likes of the auto manufacturers under a huge amount of pressure as they aren't getting the, the, the silicon chips that they require to actually create production. So the likes of VW having to shut down the operations for a couple of days just because they, they, they didn't have the parts. So we've seen a lot of disruptions in global supply chains. We'll talk about that in the economy as well. So what's going on in the French market? So I had a look at it. Um, you know, the French market's interesting. It's not one that we, we've re I've really dug into. Um, the guys are digging into it for, the, for the, the, the European portfolio. And obviously, the big ones are L'Oreal, LVMH, are kind of the, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, positions in, in, in the CAC. Uh, but this is where the, the performance came from. So it's, it's kind of a very mixed bag. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, I've kind of tried to downweight some of the smaller market caps just to get the, the bigger... Um, the bigger the bigger percentage moves as the widest market did so well, but it was very very broad based. There wasn't a specific large cap stock. It wasn't L'Oreal or, or LVMH that kind of jumped 30 40 percent. Um, and yeah, it had its fair share. Okay, smaller. So Arcos, uh, you know, down 44 percent. It's a much smaller thing. It's not, not uh, significant in the weighting. It's got nothing to do with Arcos. If you remember the, the Bill Wang story we talked about last month. Um, where we had, uh, you know, obviously the implosion of that, uh, that hedge fund, having to do with that this is actually an electronics manufacturer that uh, you know, manufactures and distributes electronics. Uh, it's, it's having rights issues and all sorts of problems. That's why it's down 44%. Uh, but overall, yeah, just, just a good month for France, just seeing Europe, Europe recovery. Um, what's happening in the local month? So this is the local market, at least. What's the key drivers of South Africa? I mean, we were... Uh, uh, you know, we were kind of uh, slightly negative for the month. So we, we were down 1.2%. Why is that? What are our diamonds and dogs? Um, so it really, it came down to, you know, we, we saw almost a rally in the small and mid caps this month, which uh, is very different from what we've been experiencing over the last, uh, what is it? Uh, let's say probably five years, but definitely over, over the, in the post-COVID recovery. As I said, that the last year has really been dominated by our, our resource companies. Uh, that have just absolutely flown. Um, what happened this month is we saw a little bit of a wobble there. So Amplats, uh, you know, the black bars on the right-hand side there, that's market cap. And you can see compared to Rabex, down 12%. It's almost insignificant as a weight in the index. But a company like Amplats, which has a significant market cap, down 15%, that's uh, helping to drag us. But of course, the biggest uh, the biggest company that was the drag on our performance uh, over the last month was Naspers. Again, it's kind of coming down to Naspers's biggest investment is going to be Tencent in China. Uh, what's happening in China? China under a little bit of pressure around that uh, the regulatory concerns. Naspers down ten percent. Uh, if you look at Naspers's weighting, Naspers and process their weighting in our index, it is significant. So with a ten percent fall in Naspers over the last uh, over the last little bit, you've seen our overall index coming down. So if you're investing in a top forty index, for example, you're probably going to get uh, hurt um, just because of that that exaggerated weighting of Naspers and how poorly it has performed. Does this mean that Naspers is finished? I don't think so. I think, uh, as I said, I think there could be an opportunity in Chinese markets. This probably is a is a, a time to accumulate. As uh, Christo quipped uh, on the desk the other day, uh, you know, we used to have it written on our wall. You know, you never short Naspers. How things have changed, but I'm still not convinced that uh, you know the, the kind of gaming spend and, and, and the growth that, that we've seen out of ten cents. And also, I suppose Naspers is a big move at the moment to try and uh, you know. Uh, sell off their stake in 10 cents and, and try and return some, some capital to shareholders just to prove that they have liquidity in that stake and narrow that huge discount that they have uh, between uh, you know the sum of the parts models. So I mean, obviously, if you take 10 cents value and look at Naspers' value, it's trading at a huge discount. It's one, one of the reasons they listed in Amsterdam a process to try and narrow that discount to, to just expand their capital base uh, and try and revalue their assets more, more effectively. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, you know there's still a, there's still a very very good buy case uh, based on some of the parts for for Naspers. Um, it's just really those Chinese regulatory concerns and, and the pressure the Chinese market has been under that's that's pulled that uh, that one back. 
Um, yeah, so it's really Amplex and NASPES that pulled our index back. The rest of it, the small and mid caps actually doing really well. You know, the, the likes of Zierda are doing very, very well. And that's, we're going to talk, talk about commodity prices now, but just as a, a little preview. Um, we've seen an interesting, interesting, how can I say it, uh, situation uh, arising in the, uh, the agri space in South Africa. Now, what normally happens is, uh, you know, the, the agri space, you know, when they get good rainfalls and that, they have these bumper crops, uh, generally prices fall. And, and uh, because they, you know, they're supplying, there's a, there's a surplus uh, and prices come under pressure. But because of the supply chain disruptions that we've seen across the globe, we've seen absolutely incredible soft commodity and hard commodity prices. If you look at the price of lumber, it's off the charts at the moment. I mean, but we've seen that in wheat and maize as well. Uh, a lot of those soft commodity prices are, are increasing. And now what our, um, our uh, kind of primary agri producers can do is they can sell on the international market as well. So what they've got is they've got great rainfalls. They've seen much higher production levels and they're expecting bumper crops. At the same time, they are, you know, the, the, the glut of supply in that way is, is not being soft up because of the um, uh, because of the, uh, the supply shortages and the supply chain disruption. So not only do they have massive production, they've also got very high prices that they're selling at. And it's creating kind of like a, a, a you know, double double tailwind for them. So um, we've seen the likes of Zeta massively at the moment. Uh, what this is going to hurt is the likes of Tiger Brands, I think. So, you know, Tiger Brands, the guys that are, you know, are not the primary producers, but are taking those input costs. So they take, you know, higher grain prices, for example, and they have to sell on to, to, to the, the public. Um, they are not able to push through their food price inflation. So they're getting squeezed, but the, those primary producers are really, really making a mint at the moment. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. That's probably why we've seen that up. We've seen, you know, obviously big, big run up in, again, value stocks, the likes of Investec. Um, I'm sure there was company specific news. I didn't see it on Investec though, but uh, overall, sm small and mid caps doing a lot better. Also, seeing the likes of Kumba up um, that may be benefiting just from, from the higher iron ore prices as well. Um, and I'm sure SPAC between Australia and China is just wonderful for Kumba, whose uh, operations are all sitting in South Africa and across South Zimbabwe and Sishan. And, uh, you know, they've got a lot further to transport to get that to Chinese ports, but uh, they've got a high quality lump. So uh, I think they probably benefiting from from the higher iron ore prices as well. Okay, so what's happening in the economy? Um, okay, I'm going to have to pick this up. So I thought, thought we were going to have a short presentation. <laughs> um, what's happening in the economy at the moment? Okay, so I'm just looking at the US economy. So uh, big news today is, is going to come out today. So we've got non-farm payrolls, 2.30 uh, this afternoon. Um, so the unemployment stat that I normally show you in the kind of the dashboard that we go through is not, um, yeah, is, is still sitting at, at last month, which is uh, unemployment sitting at 6% in the US. The Fed still sees that as too high, um, but we've got non-farm payrolls out. So I've just given you the prediction. So they predict non-farm payrolls at 978,000, uh, but there's quite a spread on, uh, on the predictions here. This, these are based on Reuters polls. Uh, minimum prediction uh, is 656,000, maximum prediction 2.1 million new, new, new jobs added. So a huge range there. And I think this is gonna be very, very key because um, at the same time, while we've got the unemployment up on the right-hand side of this chart, you've got the annual inflation rate. Now, inflation in the U.S. has come out much, much higher than expected. Now, this is kind of what's going on. I've kind of jumped, I've dropped the central bank section on this presentation. So I'm going to talk about it here instead. What's happening with the Fed and, the, and uh, certainly the U.S. economy at the moment is that many people are starting to become concerned about inflation. We are also concerned about inflation. I think that move from, um, from growth to value is going to happen. And I think it's something that we need to look at adding to portfolios, more of the value stocks that uh, kind of, you know, just more value stocks in general. But, um, yeah. Fed wants to see inflation in the U.S. moderately above 2%. Now, we've had uh, Jerome Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, coming out and saying he's willing to let inflation get all the way above 2%, and they're not concerned about it. They want to let it run higher, much higher than 2%, because of the time it's spent below 2%. And that's obviously, they, they want to allow markets to overheat. They don't, you know, with the inflation targeting framework, everyone is looking at that 2% number and kind of like very concerned that they would remove stimulus if, if we got above 2%. He kind of made it clear they're not going to remove stimulus. They want inflation to come back into the system. Um, now we've got inflation. The expectation around this was at 2.5, it came in at 2.6. So it was slightly ahead of expectations on, on the US inflation number. But the Fed and, and the monetary authorities are seeing inflation as transitory. They're saying because of the supply chain disruptions we've seen thanks to coronavirus and all the issues that we've seen, we've seen 
you, you know, a lack of a lack of supply of goods, and we see prices of goods that are being produced increase. And what they're expecting is manufacturing to pick up, but they're not seeing it in wage price inflation. No one is predicting wage price inflation. You can see the, the wage price inflation, so average hourly earnings, monthly, and I think the, the Reuters poll, they're expected to be flat. We're not expecting to see massive wage price inflation come through, uh, you know, certainly in, in the numbers today. Um, but we are expecting the unemployment rate to come down. So Reuters poll average, the consensus expectation is for us to move from 6% un uh, unemployment in the US down to about 5.8%. Uh, obviously, a miss or a beat this afternoon is going to inform how people are expecting monetary policy to play out. A big beat where we say unemployment coming down to say like, let's say 5% or 4.5% miraculously. That kind of beat will immediately um, you know, put in expectations that we are going to start seeing wage price inflation. The, 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 uh, you can also see the, the participation rate, which is at 61%. So if more people are participating in the US labor force, that's also going to stoke the idea that we can get wage price inflation. Wage price inflation will be a concern for the Fed, and they might start to change their rhetoric around whether this inflation is going to be transitory or not. Um, so that's very, very important to see. You know, strong, strong unemployment rate, like strong drop in unemployment rate, big jump in the average hourly earnings, or a big, a big increase in the participation rate. And you're probably going to see markets get a little bit nervy about the, the, the removal of stimulus, the, you know, what they used to call the paper tantrum, the idea that we might see um, bonds coming uh, coming down a little bit uh, more quickly. The idea that good numbers, which are, because these would be good numbers, are bad numbers because of the amount of stimulus in, in the system at the moment and, and the reliance on, on financial markets on the stimulus. But we'll, we'll see how the numbers pan, pan out this afternoon. Um, and I think they're going to be very, very key. One interesting thing that we picked up about the Fed uh, over the last week or so, um, so far, uh, uh, Jay Powell has been very, very um, unconcerned. He's been very, very uh, accommodating uh, around asset price bubbles. So, you know, the idea that uh, because of the loose monetary policy, we had stock markets at record highs, we had coronavirus, we had uh, pretty much the worst, worst economic shock in, 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 in our lifetime. Um, and the fact that markets were at record highs was not a concern for him. He came out in the FOMC meeting and said, if people feel more wealthy and if stock markets are at records, but there's no inflation, then there's no problem. He said this. Now, in an interesting turn of events this week, we had, I think it was, it was actually last week, the Dallas Fed came out and said, they are concerned, they are very concerned about the monetary policy impact on financial markets and how it's creating asset bubbles. It's a total break with what the, the official Fed rhetoric is. Um, and if that is something that is starting to formulate in the back of people's minds, that again will feed into the idea that we're going to see a removal of, of, of some of this monetary stimulus, which really is um, a boost in markets. Of course, we've still got the, the fiscal stimulus coming through from Biden, which is going to still be very, very supportive. But for now, this is kind of what we're looking at around, uh, around certainly the jobs numbers today and just keeping an eye on, on what those stimulus packages are, are going to mean for financial markets you know. I don't, as we have discussed in investment company before, I really don't believe that we're going to see markets collapse based on uh, a withdrawal of stimulus. Because as soon as markets get nervy, as soon as we have that kind of taper tantrum attitude, um, immediately you'll see the Fed almost reversing it. Now, that's all fine until we have runaway inflation. So, so for us, it's like kind of understanding the inflation picture is, is very, very important. And it is our base case that we are going to see much higher inflation over the next five years than we have over the previous five years or, or even previous 10 years. I think the, the, the world is going to get back to a more normal inflationary environment. Um, some of the big gains of the deflation effect of technology is, is wearing thin. Um, and I, yeah, we, we, we do think that we're going to see higher inflation. Okay. So what's going on with the coronavirus? So I think before we just touch on coronavirus, I just want to have a look at the VIX quickly because we're talking about it. So um, normally I look at the VIX. So the VIX is the volatility index. It uh, um, basically gives, people call it the fear and greed index. And it gives you a sense of how much volatility is in market and, and how worried are people about markets. Um, you can see what happens. So the VIX was tracking at sort of between 10 and 12, uh, 10 and 12. Uh, for a long time with the you know, occasional spikes when there was a little bit of jitters in the market. And then obviously the pandemic happened uh, last year. And that's where you've got that big spike in the bottom chart. Uh, what's been happening since then is we've had the VIX, so we've had volatility running significantly higher than, than usual. That's starting to pull back. Last week, last month it was at around 16. It's actually ticked up slightly this month. So we are still, we, while we're getting better, we're still not at those kind of like low volatility uh, levels that we saw um, you know, coming, you know, pre-pandemic. We're not 
you know, from the volatility point of view, out of the woods yet. That's kind of changing the option pricing on a, on a lot of the, the structured products. Um, it's one, one of the reasons that we, we deliver a lot of auto calls to clients rather than uh, standard uh, uh, standard kind of products. It's also obviously lower interest rates are making those standard products a little bit less attractive. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. So it's a volatility. We're not kind of, the, the volatility in this status, we're not out of the woods yet. Now, I thought I'd just include the, the, the top graph as well, which is, um, you know, we've just been through the pandemic. We're starting to get back to normal now. And we're going to talk about the pandemic numbers now. But I just wanted to put this in context for you. You know, if you're thinking that we see, you're suddenly going to get a, a big pullback in markets, you suddenly think the currency is going to go back to 19 grams of the dollar. If you think that the, the kind of like volatility that we've seen over the last year will return in the short term, it's probably unlikely. Um, why do I say that? This is a long-term chart. You can't see the numbers. The spike in the middle, um, where my cursor is, let me grab my cursor quickly. Spike in the middle. Uh, let's go cursor. The spike in the middle over here, if you can have a look over here. Um, that spike is... Um, so click for you. Uh, that spike there, that's the 2008 crisis. And, and then looking at down, this is kind of like dot, dot combination crisis down there. Um, and that's uh, COVID pandemic. So this is, it, it, these, these spikes are significant. They're, they're kind of like decade, decade events. Um, it's not to say we can't have one immediately, but it's, it's probably not going to be from a pandemic. It's, it's got to be something unknown that is really going to get uh, markets worried again. Otherwise, we do expect markets to track uh, volatility. Uh, volatility track a lot lower than it has been over the last year. Um, okay, so let's go and have a look at the pandemic quickly. I'm talking a lot today, it shouldn't be. Um, yeah, so let's just... Okay. So what's happening in the pandemic? Um, yeah, so just a quick one. We up to 1.2 billion doses. Uh, last month, we had about 700 million doses. Those are people that have had at least one dose. Uh, we've got 3.75% of the global population fully vaccinated, which is not much. Um, you know, we've got 8% that have received at least one dose. Um, and, uh, you know, currently 134 million active cases. Now, what's going on in the, in the virus? I mean, the big, the big worry at this stage has been... Uh, Okay, so the big worry about uh, the, the coronavirus at the moment um, is, is India. So India is the big concern. It's obviously a double mutation, what they're talking about. And that double mutation, it's just, it's got, it's, it's absolutely berserk. I mean, I think the, the problem that India has at the moment is, is significant. And I think there's real concerns that this might translate into the rest of the world if it is a double mutation potentially vaccines that, that work for, you know, the South African variant or the UK variant um, are not going to work for the, for the, for the um, uh, Indian variant. Uh, now, interestingly, um, yeah, South Africa, no sign of a third wave coming through. United States also under control, United Kingdom under control, global obviously picking up because of the, the big waiting in India, just the size of the population uh, that we're talking about here. Um, Israel, which was the, the most vaccinated, and I've got that chart up there of, uh, you know, kind of vaccination levels. Israel at about 60% and, and tapering off. Um, we're not seeing a resurgence in, in numbers in Israel. France, which was going through a second wave, has also come back. It might be one of the reasons the French markets are up as they are. Um, we're seeing UK more than 50%, um, yeah, UK more than 50% of the um, population is vaccinated. Now, as you can see, you get this kind of tapering effect uh, on Israel when you get to about 60%. Now, they say about 30% of people um, are just anti-vaxxers. They just will not uh, take the vaccine. It's very difficult to get them vaccinated. So the idea of getting any population to around an 80% vaccination rate is, is, is going to be very, very difficult. And you need to start looking at 65 to 70% as fully vaccinated. It's just you're not going to get it right. Um, you know, obviously statistical anomalies as well. Um, what we are seeing though is obviously the developed market is, is way ahead as we would expect, uh, but we are seeing the emerging market start to catch up as well. So the likes of Turkey and Brazil, their vaccine programs rolling out quickly. Uh, India as well, it, it, it is vaccinating a huge amount of people. Now, you know, looking at India, India is a unique situation. So I've just got this chart up here. So one of the, 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 the stats that, that really can, um, you know, is, is pretty valid is, um, uh, you know, confirmed deaths uh, per million people. And you can see that India is much, much lower than, than South America, European Union, US, and United Kingdom. 
Um, why is that? Are they succeeding in, in, in preventing the, the virus from spreading? It's probably uh, more a gathering of data um, uh, issue. It's probably not uh, around the idea that uh, just because India is so huge, it might seem like a big problem in the absolute number of cases that, that are being received. But overall, from a relative point of view, they're actually doing okay. That's probably not the case. It's actually got to do more with the fact that the statistics coming out of India just with the pandemic are, are, not, uh, are not accurate. And because of that, you can expect India probably to have a much higher death rate. Uh, and that is creating real concerns of, a, of contagion and a translation into the rest of the world. Uh, you know, I've said in the previous presentations that we think that um, it's, you know, the coronavirus is something that is, you know, you can start to put it from a financial market point of view in your rear view mirror. I still think that that's the case. And it's becoming more and more apparent, apparent that we are going to have the idea of constant booster shots to, to combat the, the vaccine. We've had talks about, um, obviously, removing patents on vaccines. We had Moderna come and say, it's not going to make any difference anyway, because there are no people that, that have the ability to create this other than the companies that have done it. It's not something that easily will uh, translate to mass manufacturing facilities. Um, whether that's Moderna talking their own book or not remains to be seen. Aspen seems to be able to create the vaccine, no problem. But um, yeah, real, I suppose, yeah, looking at it, I think the coronavirus is going to be here to stay, but you probably will need a booster shot uh, going forward, the same as like a flu vaccine. Um, but I think the economic disruption is coming to an end. We've got this kind of supply chain problems at the moment, but we as humans will learn to live with it. Um, and that's why we've seen financial markets still doing fairly well. And I don't see them pulling back on the back of this. Uh, I don't think coronavirus is going to be the reason for another big pullback in markets. It's probably going to be something else uh, entirely. Uh, I've talked about the VIX. Okay, so normally every every month, uh, okay, so this is kind of your stock pick for the day. Um, every month, I normally just take one um, one idea, one big story, one th event that happened, and we chat about it and have a look at it. Um, today, uh, I've got Coinbase. So Coinbase listed uh, last month. So it's kind of middle of last month and listed on the NASDAQ. So what does Coinbase do? Uh, I like the idea of Coinbase. I don't, I don't know why. Uh, because it is super, super, super speculative as well. <laughs> so um, let me just have a look here. Yeah, so I was answering these like questions. Okay, yeah, so Coinbase is super speculative. Like, so please, we can't put this in a managed portfolio for clients. We just can't. It's way too crazy. Now, what is Coinbase? Coinbase is a financial technology company, provides end-to-end -end infrastructure and technology focused on building a crypto economy, transparent systems, and enabling crypto to uh, people to leverage crypto assets, digital assets using blockchain technology. What does all that mean? It's basically a good crypto exchange. It's got about 45 crypto products on it. Um, and I think, you know, we, we always get a lot of questions about, you know, can we access Bitcoin now? Can we access the crypto markets through, through you know, through Rand Swiss? Um, this is something that I, I would prefer clients to do, you know, put it that way. And I think I might have a punt on it as well. Um, yes, you can buy and sell crypto on, on our trading platforms. Uh, we've got about 10, 10 crypto CFDs listed, so you can buy Bitcoin and Ethereum and that. You're not buying the physical crypto, but you're buying a contract uh, that re which that references the price of the crypto underneath. Great for active traders, not something that you want to buy longer term. We also have a Swiss banking partner, which was the first European bank to allow uh, crypto warehousing. So there you can have real Bitcoins. You can't transfer it in and out of the bank because the bank wants to, to hold the crypto themselves. They act as the crypto custodian. But you can open a Swiss bank account and you can, with all the Swiss banking regulation around it, hold on, uh, hold Bitcoin inside the account. So those are the two ways of doing it. But I don't know if I would want to buy, you know, if I was a serious investor, is that the way, you know, valuing crypto is almost impossible. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, comparisons you can make to gold. You can value it based on the fundamentals of how much energy it takes to use. But the fact remains that crypto is only got value because people want to buy it. It's like gold. It's because they, they it's, it's only through common belief that everyone wants to work with crypto as a system. Um, and believes that one day it might become a decentralized uh, currency that it has value. Now, for me, that's a very difficult thing to value. You can't value it on, on, on present value and future cash flows. You can't do that because it doesn't have any cash flows. It, its entire value is based on scarcity. Uh, and because of that, it is far, far more difficult to value. Now, with a company like Coinbase, which is essentially a crypto exchange, this is something you can value. You still get exposure to blockchain and the crypto economy, but it has real earnings. It has earnings that you can you can look at its uh, 
financials and you can say how much revenue, how much profit is this company making, how much is it worth and how much will it distribute to shareholders. It's also listed on the NASDAQ. So it's got all sorts of protections around it that you don't have when you're buying on an exchange like a Luna or a Kraken or a Shapeshift or whatever it is. And there's all sorts of horror stories about guys that have had Bitcoin on, you know, in wallets on those, those uh, you know, using those exchanges. They've got the, the Bitcoin in digital wallets and the Bitcoin just is gone. It just disappears. They have a transaction that moves the, the, the coins out and, you know, there's no way of tracing it. So the, the clients just lose money. This is a very different prospect. You can absolutely lose money on something like Coinbase, but, um, but if you're not going to lose it because the shares just disappear out of your account. There's proper custodians here. Our custodian is Citibank. There's, there's a much higher level of safety. So why do I like Coinbase and why do I like it? So one, I come from a stockbroking background. I might be managing portfolios these days, but in, at my heart, I remember when we used to charge 0.7% you, you know, percent on every transaction uh, that a client did, and that was the business. You know, it's interesting. We, we're looking at uh, Namibian partners, and they they essentially charging their clients 1.6 percent. I was like, who can do this these days? I mean, our worst retail rate is half a percent. You know, many many uh, people are trading at institutional rates. They're trading at 20 basis points. I mean, there's hardly any money, you know, in, in, in stockbroking. And the way that it's going is eventually we're all going to be working like Robert, and there are going to be no fees on execution. Like it's just the way that the market is going. But in Bitcoin and in the crypto economy, this is, people just accept this. The re- I, I was chatting to a friend of mine who, who's very into his crypto, and they pay between 2 and 3% on the value of their transactions. I mean, I look at this, this is daylight robbery. You guys are getting absolutely hammered. You could be trading stocks at, at literally 20, 30 times cheaper than you are in the crypto economy. But, they, but you know, because of the volatility and because of how much these things are moving, um, they don't mind paying 2 3%. Now, I was looking at that from a professional point of view, going, oh, I wish I could have participated in that. Now, I've realized how I can. You buy Coinbase. As a shareholder in Coinbase, you are essentially going to be remunerated through the volume of transactions that this company is doing. And you can see it in their numbers. They have real numbers. So they, they, the IPO, they're listed. They listed at a fantastic price and the stock price has collapsed. So it's going to be very volatile as with most listings. But I think, you know, if the stock keeps on falling, I think there, there's a valid argument to, to be had going into this. Um, you're trading, you know, I think originally it was trading on about 100 times sales. So, you know, with the, the, the sell-off now be on about 60 or 70 times sales, which is still high. But look at how their sales have been growing. 2019, they made $483 million. 2020, they made $1.1 billion. In the first quarter of 2021, they made $1.8 billion. I mean, that is incredible growth. Now, they've got 56 million retail users. So they have a community already on their on their system. 7,000 institutions. They operate, obviously, they're crypto. So they operate in many, many jurisdictions. Um, but just that that volume, that community, if they continue to trade there and, and they trade in that, um, you know, if they manage to build this, this exchange, basically, and if Bitcoin and, and crypto really works out, um, I think there's a significant upside in this. It doesn't come without risks. Of course, there are massive risks in this. One, there's le- probably less risk than buying an Ethereum or Bitcoin directly because obviously this has got exposure to 45 different crypto assets. If Bitcoin doesn't happen to be the one uh, cryptocurrency that ends up as the world's uh, currency, Maybe Ethereum will. I mean, a lot of people are arguing that Ether is a much better, um, better cryptocurrency. Doesn't matter. You've got a diversified basket if you buy into, into something like Coinbase. Uh, you're not reliant on only one, uh, only one kind of, uh, cryptocurrency uh, being there. What are what are the problems with this? And and they are like I said, like I like it because you can value it. I like it because it has huge commissions. I like it because those the, the infrastructure of an exchange. An exchange is a very profitable business in general. The infrastructure, you know, when, when it earns its extra dollar, most of that dollar actually falls down into, into, into its profit line. There's very little additional cost. It's, it's part of how an exchange business works. So I like the idea of an exchange business. The risks are significant, though, of course. One, you've got insiders selling like crazy. Now, maybe not as crazy. So Coinbase actually was started by um, it was one of the engineers that uh, started Airbnb. Uh, the guy's name was Brian Armstrong. Um, he apparently sold 71% of his stake into the IPO. That turned out to be fake. Uh, if you look at the news headlines, that's what they would say. Uh, he only actually sold around 2% of his stake in the business, and it was just to create liquidity. But there is a lot of insider selling going on, which is never good. When insiders don't believe in the future of their, their own business, that is very, very worrying. 
But at the same time, you've just bought a crypto exchange that's listed for over $100 billion. Um, you probably want to take some off the table. No one's risk profile is, is, is to hold a lot of coin, base, let me tell you that. And that's why I'm not recommending anyone does. This is a very speculative idea that uh, you can have a look at. Um, it's also got uh, you know, other guys in it. There's ex-Goldman Sachs traders. Uh, there's all sorts of guys that, that, that make up the management team of this thing, but they have sold out of it. Uh, right now, today, it got smashed last night in, in the US. The reason was, you know, the Dogecoin, so I've called it the Dogecoin, which started essentially as a joke. Uh, everyone thinks it's going to go to $1, is not available on their platform. And people are saying, how can you be you know, the premier crypto exchange in the US and you don't offer Dogecoin and they're just selling it on the back of the Now, if they add Dogecoin, this company still has a bright future. You know, if Dogecoin collapses and, and they don't have it, no, no worries there. Um, it's it's a it's a risk maybe maybe they don't have it now but that leads me to the, the other the other risk as well you know as crypto becomes more mainstream this is a crypto specific crypto exchange they might have this move advantage but there are many established exchanges if you look at the intercontinental exchange if you you know once you get established exchanges adding crypto assets onto them through crypto custodians like the one that they've got in guernsey with Mura, um, it is possible that this exchange becomes almost irrelevant. You know, it's got that community that might prefer to use its systems. But when you can buy and sell on the New York Stock Exchange with crypto assets in a normal stockbroking account, um, their uh, unique selling proposition almost disappears. So that is also a huge risk. And of course, with crypto, there's a massive risk around regulation. You know, you've seen the, the price of Bitcoin fluctuate massively based on uh, Rumors are on regulation in the U.S. The idea that the national treasury is uh, you're going to, going to crack down. Um, the idea that uh, you know, the idea that uh, regulation is coming for, for for crypto is one of the reasons for the high volatility in, 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 in crypto assets anyway. Um, and regulation is always going to be a massive, massive uh, impact on any financial services company. At the moment, it is a wild west out there with crypto. The FSCA has come out and said they're not basically, you know, they'll issue warnings and that, but if you lose money on crypto, that's your problem. You have no onboard as, as recourse. Um, so there's huge, huge issues around uh, around around crypto and, and what the regulation will mean for it. It's a very uncertain place. It is the wild west, but also it's in the wild west that you can make there's lots of opportunity. So this, this kind of idea to, to buy some buy into something like Coinbase, um, it is really speculative. Please don't think that we're buying this for clients like in, in our managed portfolios. This is kind of if you want to take a, a little bit of cash and have a punt, almost instead of buying your, your Bitcoin, I would look at something like Coinbase, a little bit more diversified, a little bit more formal, um, and I think can do very, very well, especially if crypto, if crypto prices keep going up. Um, so that's kind of like the little stock pick idea for the day. Uh, next one. Okay, so the commodity market. So we talked a little bit about commodity markets. Just give you the presentation. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we talked about commodity markets. So I've just put up on the top left hand side the, the Bloomberg Commodity Index. Absolutely flying in April. This is again, it's got to do with supply chain disruptions. Um, commodities just berserk everywhere. Uh, I've got grain futures up there. So you've got corn, beans, wheat, all of them. April, massive, massive spike towards the end of April, uh, or at least uh, throughout the whole of April. Sugar, coffee, cocoa, all of it uh, kind of spiking. Okay, cocoa, not, not doing what the rest are doing, but also big, big moves up. Lumber futures. So this is, uh, you know, if you're not too familiar with this, this is uh, U.S. housing starts. Um, because that kind of gives you a sense of the demand for lumber. So where's where's the spike coming from? Yes, we've had slightly more housing starts in the US and that is helping to pull it up. But this is really coming from the supply chain disruption. So you see the lumber prices going absolutely berserk in April. We've got all the different oil types, so Brent crude, LOL, LCO, um, C1, uh, all of them kind of tracking each other, but uh, oil prices kind of ticking back up to the, the top of that 70. Like I said, we kind of sold out of our, our oil positions kind of early March. Uh, it looked like a great decision. They have ticked up again, but we haven't seen any absolute new highs in oil. I still think that OPEC is going to maintain, uh, is going to slowly let oil back onto the market. I don't see oil going above sort of 80, probably above $90 a barrel. Um, I think we're going to hover here. I think uh, some of the, those uh, kind of quick gains in, in oil players have been made. Um, just my opinion. 
I definitely, uh, it's been a month of, of excessive rises in commodity prices, higher commodity prices, again, speak to the inflation outlook. If the raw materials are getting more expensive, um, this will probably feed through to inflation. We've seen it uh, also in the uh, inflation. One of the reasons that the inflation number in the US that we talked about was, beat, uh, was higher than expectations is gasoline prices, 22.5% higher uh, inside that uh, inflation number. Electricity prices is up 2.5%. Um, utility gas also up 9.8%, all of that ahead of expectations. So energy prices uh, and oil prices are a huge determinant of inflation. So if the, they do remain elevated, inflation will come into the system. Again, part of our base case, we're going to see high inflation. Um, so we've got five minutes left. So <laughs> the race through the last slide. Um, okay, currency markets for May. I always do this chart. I said to you guys last month, this is the time, uh, 14 43, it's time to get money out. I said, I bet you the market is going to be wrong. It did. So we've had very strong, we've been very, very volatile, but we now sort of trade a range between kind of 1450 and kind of 1420, 1415, uh, maybe at the, at the lower end, depending on where you get your spot rate. Um, current price is 1423, so my trade would definitely not have worked out, but I still do believe that we're going to see higher, um, higher rand dollar prices. Don't think we're going back to 19, I don't think that's going to happen, but definitely at 1423, I get the sense that uh, you know, the, the, the currency is, is fairly, fairly strong given historical standards. Um, from a technical point of view, we're kind of out the bottom of the chart. We might have had a, a break of that short term uh, line. You know, if you look down at the end of that chart back to about 1450, we're retesting that line now. Next week probably will be weaker. I've been calling the currency weaker for a while, ever since uh, you know I was calling off the bottom of that channel. We have broken the bottom of the channel now, but I still think we're going to get weaker currency. Um, looking at the big bank predictions, Goldman Sachs, 1380, they are the most bullish by a long way. The other big banks all have targets above 15. So um, you know, Absa Capital 1551, Medbank came in this month, they haven't had a prediction in a while, 1530. Investec, they were at 1590, they pulled their estimate down to 1565. Why is this important? Because big banks, when they put out these estimates, this is what they're telling their client base, this is what they're uh, informing businesses, this is, you know, this is what their trading desks are doing. So to understand where they see the currency is important because it will inform uh, their decisions on, on how they move assets around. Um, so they all are seeing it slightly weaker than it is now. Um, yeah, so we've got uh, current, current smart estimate is unchanged. We've actually seen the median price, which is the middle most value, uh, moving up to uh, 1528 from 1550. So you, you know, you, you've seen a slight, you know, it's one of the measures of central tendency, but uh, you know, you're seeing a slight move up in the median price. But overall, kind of, you're seeing also the, the, the upper, the upper, uh, the max price, which is EMS this week, or at least this month, uh, 1620. Um, it's quite a quite a range, but I'd say kind of mid 15s is where the fair value of the currency is at the moment. So 1423, I'd still be buying dollars at this stage. What's happening to the dollar index? Um, dollar index is 2.8 percent weaker, so we've seen a weaker dollar. So some of this is coming off a weaker dollar. Um, remember the dollar, I thought I'd just actually put, I always talk about the dollar index. I'm not sure if you guys know what it is, but remember the dollar index is uh, the value of the US dollar versus a basket of foreign currencies, specifically US trading partners. So the RAND is not included in the dollar index, but it is a good sense of how is the dollar performing. But you can see it's mainly against established safe haven type currencies, yen, Swiss franc, euro, Canadian dollar, British pound, and Swedish krona. That makes up uh, the currencies that uh, the dollar in index is measured against. But yeah, so beginning of April is pretty much the spike. The whole of April, the dollar has been weakening against the, you know, its major trading partners. So the dollar is getting weaker, um, whereas in March, we saw the dollar obviously firming up a little bit. Uh, it is volatile. Um, you know, if we see the dollar then reversing that, getting a bit stronger over May, uh, which could easily, you know, so it may go away. If we see a little bit of jitter, jitters in markets coming through, dollar a little bit weaker, then you might, um, yeah, you might see that ramp pulling back to sort of that 1450, 1470 level. I still think there's a trade in there. Um, okay, with one minute to go, quickly, global managed portfolio. So what have we been doing? How have we been looking? Um, okay, you guys know, if you don't know the portfolio, uh, we have a broad mandate to invest in listed equity. Uh, we generally think blue chip companies, uh, Google, Amazon, IBM, Pfizer, Nike, these are the kind of brands that we buy. Um, and it's really, it's, it's kind of a portfolio designed for clients that are trying to build a nest egg overseas. Um, they want to get some performance. Um, it's generally a long-term portfolio, longer than five years. 
because you're parking your money overseas, you're not planning on bringing it back and using it to pay school fees or whatever it is. This is a long-term investment op uh, like proposition. For that reason, we can go into equity markets. Um, there is no interest rates overseas anyway. It's very difficult to find bond funds that, that pay something decent given the credit risk that you take on. So equities really is the right place to be, in my opinion, overseas if you're building an ASN portfolio. Um, you probably don't want speculative rubbish in there. Let's go and buy a big blue chip stocks and see how the thing has performed. Um, yeah, over time, we've done very, very well. Let's uh, actually do this one first. Uh, so we benchmark against the MSCI World Index. We've outperformed nicely over time. So the left-hand side is kind of tracked when we first started the portfolio. As I said, we're just coming up to our five-year track record. Um, we've tracked well ahead over the last little bit. So this is a relative outperformance graph. As you can see, it was flat when we began. We were kind of tracking our, our, our benchmark very, very closely. Um, then from about February 2018, we started to outperform. Um, over the coronavirus period, we really ramped up performance. I mean, there we were well ahead of the benchmark. Um, we, we then got a little bit more conservative. We took a much higher cash weighting um, because we saw the, the aggressive run up. We kind of looked at the problems and we adopted a, a slightly more conservative approach. Um, and that uh, influenced performance slightly, brought us back to that trend line. Um, we're now getting, you know, especially with some of the big tech run up that we've seen, because uh, we do own big tech, um, we see now our, our, our portfolio outperforming again. We've kind of hit that trend line, and, and we're back to our trend of our performance, which is exactly what you want to see, and it's kind of what the methodology, which is very quantitatively based, predicts over a long period of time. Obviously, the periods where we're going to outperform, these periods where we're going to underperform, but on average, we should do a little bit better than, than, than our benchmark. Um, okay, so I've just given you a screenshot straight off the system, and there's a couple of things I want to talk about here as well. Uh, so this is actually a portfolio that we put. This is live cash that we put in the uh, portfolio. We put about 100K in the portfolio uh, five years ago. Where are we sitting at the moment? Um, we are sitting at the moment, we have uh, $100,000. Uh, this has grown to $202,000 uh, and $202,000 uh, 202, uh, 226 Something we can see that. $202,226. Um, and so uh, yeah, so basically it's uh, it's been a long webinar. <laughs> so, so yeah, we've basically doubled our money over the last over the last five years. Generally, you aim to double money over, over a 10-year period. So if we're doubling our money in dollars, which is you, you know um, over five years, I, I feel like we've done very well. Um, if you compare this to the South African markets, okay, so over, over the period, uh, South Africa is again measured in dollar terms. South Africa is only up 33%. Um, we've done over 100% over the same period. So if you bought a top 40 ETF versus this portfolio, um, you've left a lot of money on the table. So it has performed very, very well. Um, I just wanted to put a cash weighting in as well. So just to give you guys an idea of how the cash is. So we generally take three months to deploy a portfolio. So if, if you're new to the portfolio and you're watching this for the first time, it takes time to deploy a portfolio. We don't want to snatch you into the market. We want to try and get you a very fair implementation. Uh, even when we originally implemented it, it did take time uh, to bring down the cash weight. And it took a couple of months for us to deploy everything. Um, and then obviously we got very, very thin. And then as I said, like kind of... Uh, uh, middle of last year, we actually took our cash rating up. We bought a few things uh, after that, um, but we are still sitting on about a 13.5% cash rating. Our cash rating is very high. I'm still comfortable with it because we are outperforming once again. Uh, we were up 5% in dollar terms over the last month. Our benchmark was up just over 4%, so we pulled back about a percent uh, there. We're up 9.5% for the year. And there you can just see our annual performance over the year. First year, only 2%. We we're just tracking the market, 21% in dollars uh, 2017. Uh, that little dip off here, that was December over there, which is why you know, it was a little bit unfair, uh, by 3.6% because of the year just ended on a very weak note. We actually outperformed by about 4 or 5% that year. Um, the next year, obviously, now exaggerated on the upside because we were coming off a very low base, 29% uh, in 2019, 18% in 2020, and up 9.5% this year. That is what this portfolio does. Um, and yeah, it's uh, yeah. So so far, so good. As I said, we're looking to deploy new funds uh, shortly, uh, which does make it for me a very good time to, if you are looking to invest, because you're going to get uh, fresh positions as they come into the portfolio as well. It always makes it nice. I am the portfolio manager on this portfolio. Uh, as I said, uh, started June 2016 is kind of when we formalised it. Uh, that was actually our regulation date, um, and that's where we put the cash into the specific system. 
Um, and yeah, uh, it's been an interesting journey. You know, we normally look at a minimum investment of about fifty thousand um, dollars. That can we can bring it down to about thirty thirty thousand dollars. But because we do this in personal share portfolios, uh, that mirror this this portfolio exactly, which is a live portfolio. Um, uh, you know, you do have. Uh, we want to try and keep your execution cost reasonable. Uh, if it gets less than about twenty thousand dollars, it starts to push up the cost of your implementation. Uh, which we don't want because we, we're running it as a discretionary personal share portfolio for you. Um, we charge 1% on the portfolio overall. All of these performance statistics are after costs as well. So uh, it's not like the costs are taken off. This is, you know, if you put money in, that's what you would have had um, after all fees are deducted. And that's a 1% fee to manage, which is very competitive compared to the average in the trust or, or even ETF these days. You're getting some very speculative uh, ETFs. And really, if you're getting the performance, uh, we don't charge performance fees, so you, you get all the upside performance uh, from our expertise. Um, yeah, as I said, 1423, I think it's worth doing it. We can manage it. Swiss Code, Interactive Broker, Saxo Bank. My preferred is Saxo Bank at the moment. Uh, but if you're interested, give us a shout uh, and we'll get you invested. All you have to do is go to randswiss.com uh, forward slash account, click on manage portfolio, send us your ID. Um, one of the guys will contact you and help you get the account set up. As I said, we have that treasury service which makes uh, deploying into the portfolio very, very seamless. You're literally going to do an EFT from a local bank account to a local bank account, and we're going to take care of the rest. And that's the presentation for today. So thank you for watching. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found uh, it uh, something that uh, will um, uh, help inform your, your decisions and your trading and give you a nice uh, overview of what's happening in the, in the markets uh, at the moment. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for listening. I hope to see you again next month. Um, and if you have any suggestions, uh, feel free to just uh, pop me an email at info at uh, Thanks everyone for listening.